Um, and so we are we are back here today um, for the second se session of Dr. Davis's presentation. Um, this lecture is entitled Speaking Truth, Ungodly Facts, Real Power, and Holy Fear. Um, so once again, please um, welcome Dr. Davis, um, publicly welcome her uh, to speak with us again. And uh, again, there is um, a question and answer button. So if you have a question, um, please try to um, compose it and then put it into the question and answer section. There's a button on the far right corner of your toolbar. Um, those questions will be looked at and be um, given out loud by our question and answer moderator at the end of the lecture. So thank you, Dr. Davis, please continue. Okay, thank you, Dr. Levitt. It's now about two years since I took my first ever professional vow, namely that for at least a year, I would use the climate crisis as a primary lens through which to focus my preaching and teaching on the Bible. The preaching class that I described to you this morning was in partial fulfillment of that vow. I wondered whether it was going to feel artificial, as though I were forcing the Bible to say things it does not really say. But in fact, the opposite has been the case. So I have kept going even to into today. There are, I now see, reasons why this does not feel like a stretch. And the first of them is the geophysical and cultural world from which the Bible emerged. Israel is a semi-arid region, four out of 10 years being drought years on average, even before climate change. Moreover, as I said this morning, almost all Israelites were farmers. So of course they thought about weather all the time. Running through Torah and prophets especially, the biblical writers frequently reference climate patterns and climate disruption, and especially drought, as we saw in the passages from Isaiah and Jeremiah. In a sense then, my own vow to read through the lens of climate change is simply playing the hand the biblical writers dealt me, or to change the metaphor, trying to align my interpretive lens with theirs. A second reason that this focus leads to a deeper reading of the Bible follows from what I said this morning about the biblical writers as inspired diagnosticians of the human heart. Our current crisis is not in the first instance a matter for a technological or scientific fix. It is a crisis of the heart. In biblical physiology, the organ of thought, will, imagination, loyalty, faith, and faithfulness. All the distinctive ways that the human creature may respond to God, or conversely, choose to rebel against God. Humans are not the only creatures who have some inherent capacity to respond to God. As the biblical writers tell it, all creatures do in their own particular ways. Thus, in Psalm 98, the rivers clap their hands and the mountains ring with joy when God comes to judge the earth. But only the human creature has a heart in the full sense. And so we alone can make the choice to be true to God or to turn away. It occurred to me this past week, oddly, I think for the first time ever, it occurred to me in preparing this lecture that maybe this is what it means to say that we humans are created in the image of God. Because in the Bible, only God and Adam, humanity, are said to have a heart, the moral organ that is so marvelously diverse in its capacity for response. The difference is that while God's heart is constant, the human heart is not. With tragic consequences, 
that extend to the new destruction of the order God has made. I encourage you to reread the first chapters of Genesis from this heart perspective. And you will see that the evil stratagems of the human heart grieve God to the heart. That's Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. And the rest is primeval history, the great flood. Accordingly, the bottom line of my lecture is that climate emergency is the already tragic consequence of a massive malfunction of the corporate heart of humanity, or more accurate, the heart of the industrialized world. We'll follow one biblical narrative, the story of Pharaoh and the Hebrews in Exodus, as it traces the connection between cardiac dysfunction and geophysical disaster. And we'll consider how that story may enlighten the eyes of our heart, informing our moral imagination in ways that may yet prove salvific. But before we begin the exegetical work, I want to return to the notion with which I began these hints and lectures. The notion of what it means to live out of the biblical story to submit our critical moral imagination to an ancient story in such a way that it shapes our understanding of the contemporary world and our course of action within it. I am aware that might sound hopelessly old fashioned and out of touch, even profoundly dangerous. And I won't deny that a blinkered reading of scripture is dangerous, which is why I specify we need to read with a critical imagination. Yet as a scholar and teacher, I persist in focusing on the biblical story itself, rather than say, uh, spending much of my powers on historical reconstruction of ancient Israel, close philological work, the composition history of the Bible, worthy though those scholarly enterprises are, and I do count on others doing them. But my main goal as a preacher and teacher is to help my students to enter more deeply into the story and ask, what's in it for me? for us. And I do that because I'm convinced that engaging the story and all its complexity and often moral ambiguity, that that is the best way to let the Holy Spirit do its work through the text. To use the Apostle Paul's language, to let our minds be renewed rather than conformed to the thinking of the world. Far from being out of touch, going more deeply into the story may, may enable us to see what is really going on in our world and to view that world from a radically countercultural perspective. How is it that a focus on the story is countercultural? Consider this. In our fact driven information society, it is easy to regard reading and telling stories as an elective activity and largely an irrelevant one. In this unprecedented climate emergency, they say, we need the most updated science, not ancient stories. But that is a false dichotomy because information society is characteristically deaf to certain kinds of truth. And this leads to dangerous distortions, as we know. So I would argue that precisely in order to be an authentic culture, that is a culture properly informed by knowledge of every life-giving kind, we need to draw attention to modes of speaking truth 
that complement what we can learn from scientists, complement and guide us in making wise use of scientific knowledge. Send out your light and your truth, the psalmist prays. If we believe God answers that prayer for truth, then we can believe further that living into the truth, that is living with moral vision and imagination, that has concrete consequences. Moral vision is a social force, ultimately stronger than brute power. Moral imagination has the power to shape our world because it is the solid foundation of any genuine political process. Moral imagination guides us to move beyond power grabs and act as a true body politic, negotiating difference within the context of community with a concern for truth and without resort to violence. Strange to say, that is where storytelling comes in. As a force for shaping the moral imagination within the context of community, it may serve as a counter to every kind of violence and wanton destruction. As we reckon with the true and ungodly facts of climate emergency, our primary moral responsibility in this time of multiple crises may be telling a true story, telling wisely and well the great story that comes to us in some sense as the truth of God. So we turn now to the story of Pharaoh and Israel in Egypt, which is one of the master narratives of the Bible. That is to say, it is a story so basic that subsequent religious thought and multiple traditions developed largely in response to it. I am thinking, for instance, of the biblical books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Matthew, of Jewish theology and Quran, of several contemporary, Amer several contemporary Christian theologies, Latin American liberation theology, African and African American black theology. None of them would be coherent without reference to Exodus. So I figure if a good reading of this master narrative guides our thinking about climate change, then we should be able to enter into responsible con conversation with some of the best theological thinking through the ages. And that gives us a chance of speaking the truth. Moreover, several aspects of the book of Exodus make it especially pertinent to our present situation. First, it is a creation-oriented story. But in a more complex sense, than the creation story that opens Genesis. Exodus highlights the tension between creation on the one hand and the threat or reality of decreation engineered by humans. That tension between creation and decreation already implies the second relevant facet of this story, namely that it is a story about power. And again, there is a tension between the real power that becomes evident when God shows up and Pharaoh's refusal to acknowledge that power. A refusal which even those in his inner circle come to see as utterly crazed. Third, Exodus is a story about fear of various kinds. Some of it crazy fear, groundless, destructive, and self-destructive. Some of it natural fear, sensible fear that nonetheless needs to be set aside 
in favor of trusting God. And finally, there is the phenomenon of holy fear, a central concept for the biblical writers, even if most of us are uncomfortable with it. In both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, holy fear, fear of God, is the essential basis for godly action through thick and thin. Throughout Exodus, the biblical storyteller brilliantly sets forth the complex interaction among these three themes, creation, power, and fear. I hope to show that they echo with our own experience in remarkable ways. We begin with creation as the Bible, as the book of Exodus itself does. It is in Exodus is the creation narrative for Israel as a people. In Genesis, of course, the name Israel denotes just one person, the patriarch Jacob. He and his children follow Joseph to Egypt. And it is there for the first time that the name Israel de designates a whole people as we see it here. The children of Israel became fruitful and they swarmed and multiplied and became really, really massive. And the earth was filled with them. That's Exodus uh, chapter one, verse seven. What I want you to notice is all of the creation language here. Uh, I've highlighted it, became fruitful, swarmed, multiplied, the earth was filled with them. That should move us, those echoes, to ask two questions at least. First, how does that description sound if we hear it against the background of Genesis? And how does Pharaoh see this new development in Egypt? In answer to the first question, all of this Genesis, Genesis language makes it clear that God's creational intention for the descent descendants of Abraham is now being fulfilled. In the beginning, God told humans to be fruitful and multiply. Later, God promised to make from Abraham's seed a great nation. And all that is coming to pass in Egypt. So we must assume that God sees it as very good. Even that word swarmed is telling. You recall that in the first chapter of Genesis, swarm is a positive word for what healthy marine life should be doing. Let the waters swarm with swarming life, God says in verse 20, and it was so. God blesses all that swarming life. And thriving Israel itself is meant to be a source of blessing for all people. Remember how God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, through you will all the families of the fertile soil experience blessing. So we're seeing God's hope for the world fulfilled in the first chapter of Exodus. But of course, that's not how Pharaoh sees it at all. In his eyes, swarming Israelites are a threat. They will outnumber us, and then we are done for, Pharaoh says. The Israelites are abhorrent in their very abundance. They are less than Egyptian, even less than human maybe something like the swarming creatures of the Nile, reptiles, toads. That's how Pharaoh sees it, and we readers know something Pharaoh does not yet know. Namely, that Egypt is going to experience terrible infestations of these swarming creatures, starting with frogs, the second plague, hopping out of the Nile into every Egyptian hovel and palace, into the oven and the bed. And then later, the fourth plague of flies, 
the eighth plague of locusts. We might say that in Fallow's anxious imagination, those several infestations are already happening. Egypt is crawling with these Israelite pests. I show you here Nina Paley's uh, images of the 10 plagues. Thus, already in these first few verses of Exodus, we see a couple of things. First, Pharaoh is simultaneously afraid of the Israelites and contemptuous of their very existence. On the surface, that seems to be a contradiction. But in fact, the combination of fear and contempt is the dynamic of genocidal oppression in every age and often the express warrant for it. You have to make people afraid in order for them to want to exterminate others. And further, you have to make the dangerous others look less than human. So their extin extinction can be vaunted as a heroic act that saves the only fully human civilization, namely that of the empire. A second thing evident from these first verses of Exodus is that Pharaoh is on a collision course with God and the divine intentions for the world. And if you've read Genesis, then you know that kind of collision spells disaster, indeed annihilation for those who set themselves against God's intention for creation. Think the flood. Think Sodom and Gomorrah. But further, we will see that Pharaoh's stubborn determination to stay on course has an impact on creation itself. The long plague narrative shows Egypt's beautiful ecosystems coming undone one by one, starting with the Nile turning to blood, the lifeblood of Egypt turning to blood. Then all those swarms we talked about, frogs and lice and flies and locusts, locusts. Pharaoh's own courtiers see that the disaster is total. On the brink of the locust plague, the eighth plague, they say to their monarch, let the people go. Do you not know that Israel, is, do you not know that Egypt is lost? It's vanished? This place, our place, has vanished. In that poignant, bewildered outcry, I hear the echo of warnings about the condition of our planet from scientists stating as far back as the 1970s. Even a few theologians, I'm thinking of Bill McKibben, got into the game fairly early. In 1989, Bill McKibben wrote The End of Nature, and everything he has written since echoes what Pharaoh's courtiers said on the cusp of the eighth plague. Egypt is history. Our place, the earth as we once knew it, has vanished. And the Exodus story confronts us with the question, will we change our ways now? The plague on the firstborn brought death on every Egyptian household, including Pharaoh's own. But still he did not stop until finally the ruler of Egypt and his army lay drowned at the Red Sea. Pharaoh is himself one of the most brilliantly drawn characters in all of scripture. He is the biblical archetype of the absolute tyrant, the self-deluded monarch who pits his power against gods. He is self-idolatrous, sociopathic, heedless in destruction of his own land and people, not to mention the destruction of the Israelites. The biblical portrait is so amazingly accurate that we can easily compare the Pharaoh of the Bible 
with such modern tyrants as are known to us. The basic type has not changed through the millennia. However, a clear-eyed appraisal of their failings is a necessity, but it must not become an excuse for ignoring our own failings. That too is our duty. A good critical reading of Exodus should help us see that Pharaoh is more than just a lone, crazy tyrant. Note that the Pharaoh in Exodus is never named. And I think that's significant. Just because this Pharaoh in the text is anonymous, he is more than just another powerful historical figure. No, nameless Pharaoh stands in for the empire of Egypt itself. The whole system of domination that stands in opposition to God's plan for creation. The power system that vanishes beneath the waters of the Red Sea. This is something for us to ponder, implicated as we all are in, in another vast and destructive empire that is heedless of human life and ecological cost. Few of us know an alternative to that system. We have gotten used to it. In the language of Exodus, we have hardened our hearts. So to make the truth plain, if we are to have any hope of getting out of this God awful mess that we are in, hope of at least mitigating the worst effects of the climate change we have precipitated, we need to summon the courage and the humility to recognize how our culture as a whole is a sort of corporate fallow. Being healed of our heart disease means finding the political will to stop economic, industrial, and social practices, to dismantle systems that are currently wreaking destruction on pharaonic scale. Now let's look more closely at Pharaoh. As I said, he is a sociopath, erratic, rage prone, disconnected from reality. Putting that another way, Pharaoh makes his own reality of which he is the sole inhabitant. His own voice is the only authority he heeds. Seized by a rational fear of the swarming Israelites, Pharaoh determines to destroy their male babies the future workers on whose backs his empire rests. This is the original biblical slaughter of the innocents. Using a phrase that Christians normally apply to the evangelist Matthew's story of King Herod killing Jewish children to be sure that the infant Messiah is killed. Matthew is following the master narrative this is a replay of Pharaoh killing Hebrew babies. The death of children in the Bible is an aspect of the great story that should arrest our attention as we ponder climate change. It forces us to imagine the impact of that reality on a generation yet to be born. Probably all of us know generous, thoughtful, faithful people who have decided not to have children because they see the climate change battle as already lost. The question of how to be responsible parents or responsible not parents would seem to be one of the most agonizing aspects of climate crisis. It is obvious but worth saying, there is no more hope-filled human act than providing for the well-being of children, whether one does that as a parent or in less direct ways. 
Moreover, in a time of looming catastrophe, no act requires more courage or more discerning vision. It is simply disingenuous to defend the rights of the unborn by focusing exclusively on abortion while ignoring the need for the far reaching structural changes that must happen soon. So children may grow up in the carbon neutral world that God made and we have wrecked. In short, it is a scam to say that you can love babies or you can love trees and you must choose which. In reality, you must love both in ways that are personal, visionary, active, and yes, political. In our current climate, our geophysical and political climate, such love is deeply costly and therefore inevitably risky. The theme of risky love moves us deeper into the Exodus story. I ask in the face of Pharaoh's death dealing ban on Hebrew babies, who in the story acts with faith, hope and love? The answer is a series of women who like most of the women in the Bible exercise little social power. Just a side note on women in the Bible. Most women are minor characters about whom we know little, including their names. But I want to suggest that that is exactly what makes it important to pay attention to the so-called minor female characters. Because biblical women stand for all the ordinary people of whatever gender who do not get to shape history or so it seems. But in fact, in Exodus, we see change happening precisely through women who are practitioners of faith, hope, and love. So remember with me the women of Exodus. First among them, if we may have the next slide, are the midwives working with the enslaved population women who fear God, we are told, and therefore refuse to murder the babes, presumably at the risk of their own lives. That is holy fear at work. Next, Moses' mother, Yocheved, and his sister, Miriam, who with vision and ingenuity literally launch Moses into an unimaginable future. Then Pharaoh's daughter, who has high status, but no name, no place in the history of her people. Nonetheless, she has compassion upon one child, an infant outlaw from the subjugated people that her father deems subhuman. In the palace of a tyrant, she brings a baby sentenced to death for the crime of his ethnicity. And somehow, against all odds, she raises him to be a compassionate man. Thus, she too has a crucial role in opening up the future for the people Israel and opening a space for God to work. One more important woman in the story. When Moses is grown, his Midianite wife, Zipporah, circumcises him as her bridegroom of blood. The passage is enigmatic and it does not fit smoothly into the larger narrative, but maybe that's just the point. It doesn't fit. Moses himself no longer fits. The prince of Egypt is circumcised by a woman of the desert. She cuts him with a flint knife, marks him forever as a non-Egyptian. He cannot return to his place in the old world. Now circumcised Moses is visibly a covenant partner, 
with the God who will use him against his adoptive family, use him to lead Pharaoh's slaves to freedom. These women are a cloud of witnesses to the power of faith, hope, and love. Their stories may encourage us, literally uh, put heart into us. They may heal us of our heart disease by speaking realistically about how, how power operates in our world. These women do not stop Pharaoh from destroying Egypt, nor from murdering countless Israelite children. The Bible is not fantasy literature. Destructive power is real and its effects are tragically permanent. And yet by their actions, these powerful women, mostly of low social stature, open up a new world of possibility that has God as its center and motive force. Now let's end our reading of this first part of Exodus by looking at the moment when the Israelites as a whole people make a decisive turn toward the God who brought them out of Egypt. Their re reorientation, their conversion, so to speak, happens between one shore of the Red Sea and the other. Compare these two sentences from the beginning and the end of the crossing of the sea. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked and Hine, whoa, Egypt was coming on right behind them and they were very afraid. And then the pivot point, the conversion. And Israel saw Egypt dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great hand, the act of power that the Lord had performed against Egypt. And the people feared the Lord. And they trusted in the Lord and in Moses, his servant. You might say that their conversion at the Red Sea is from one kind of fear to another. At first, the Israelites are quite naturally afraid of Egypt, of Pharaoh and his army. And then suddenly, Egypt is dead on the seashore and Israel has lived to see it. Yet they don't just relax and have a party. In fact, they're still afraid, but now their focus is turned. The focus of their fear is God. And paradoxically, the fear of God is associated not with dread, but with trust. At the Red Sea, natural fear is converted into holy fear, fear of the Lord which is the standard biblical term for what we would call true faith. Fear of God is nothing other than knowing where the real power in the universe resides and acting on that knowledge. So fear of God is the diametric opposite of arrogance, of recklessness, of moral blindness. In short, fear of the Lord is the opposite of pharaonic insanity. This is a pivot point in the whole history of Israel. Every hope that the biblical writers hold out all through the rest of Torah prophets on into the New Testament, every imperishable hope stems from this moment when Israel ceases to be dominated by a natural fear in this case, fear of the tyrant who seem, seems to hold all the cards and starts to trust in God. I suggest to you that the time has come for us, their spiritual descendants, to cultivate holy fear as the key to our own sanity.
if we can come summon the spiritual strength to feel healthy fear, then we will indeed be afraid of carrying on as though we ourselves had created the world, as though the world were a machine that operates according to our dictates. We have stumbled on a recognition that surprises us far more than it would surprise the biblical writers. This rec recognition. The future of humanity depends on our learning fear of the eternal, fear of the Lord, which is not paralyzing, but genuinely empowering. For holy fear is simply the flip side of the love of God. Thus, holy fear sets us on the way that leads to life, life for ourselves and generations yet unborn. One psalmist calls that way that leads to life in a beautiful phrase, the way that leads, the way that is forever, derech olam, Psalm 139. May we live to walk that way together, even in our own time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for another beautiful lecture uh, on this afternoon. Uh, my name is John Inscore Essay. I teach church history, Baptist heritage, and rural studies here at, uh, at BSK, and we want to enter into a time of question and answer, much like we had in this morning session. There is a Q&A box down in the, the bottom part of your screen where you can put in some questions, and we'll try to see um, if we can get to some of these uh, as we make our way through. I want to apologize in advance if I miss your question or misunderstand it or misconvey it uh, to Dr. Davis. Um, bear with me. I'll, I'll try to get that Right, and while y'all are maybe getting some things into that uh, into that uh, spot, I will um, open with a um, question here. First, uh, you you talked uh, early on about the small creatures, the slithering, swarming, and you showed us some pictures of smaller smaller creatures. And um, I was struck in that moment. Uh, also, your connection to the authentic culture requiring that we learn to speak truths that complement what we learn from scientists. Um, and part of what a lot of scientists do is study the, the absenting of small things um, who, who chart these things. I'm just wondering if you might say a little more about it, it was the approach of small creatures, the death of small creatures, the stench of the death of these small things that we're connected and is, is, is there something there for us as we consider complementary listening and noticing the absenting, the piling up of small things in our own time as a, as a, as a sign? I'm inclined to take that more as a comment than as a question. <laughs> um, um, with your well, permission. Maybe Maybe the question would be, do you have any thoughts on how we as Christians in churches and seminaries and settings can do some of that kind of listening, complementary listening? Um, and maybe that was an example that I thought of, but you might have a different or better one, hopefully, than even okay. that one, maybe. Okay. No, I think that was a very good one. Um, and I'd say... Um, Two things. Um, one, pay attention to where you are. Uh, pay attention to the losses that people who are closest to you are feeling, closest to you in your ministry. Um, and certainly one thing that I have learned um, in writing on something that from a certain perspective I have no business writing on. You know, I don't 
Um, I'm an urban urbanite, a peri urbanite, and I um, I don't know directly about life on the land. Um, but what I have learned in speaking to people who do is that everyone feels a massive sense of loss and grief. Everyone who lives close to the land. Um, and even if they're involved, I mean, others of you would know much more than I do, but in my experience, even those who are involved in industrialized farming are doing it more out of desperation than conviction in many cases and feel um, an immense sense of loss. I am thinking about one of my students who moved into her United Methodist pastor um, and her um, assignment right out of seminary was an area, uh, maybe a 30 minute drive from Durham, still a farming area. Um, and she began someone, it's a long story and just to make it relatively short, um, someone in the community, uh, the granddaughter of a man born into slavery, um, had a vision that the most important thing she could do for healing of that community, and it was a community that was torn um, by racial strife. There had been a racially motivated murder in the community shortly before my student moved there. Um, she, this woman had a vision that the best thing she could do would be to give five acres of land to, um, to the church um, because my student, Grace Hackney, um, had decided that she was going to try to create something for the community as a, as a means of healing. And from that, then they created a community supported agriculture. Um, and gave the produce to people in the country who um, that rural community was nonetheless something of a food desert for many people. Um, and many farmers in the community were not comfortable, many older people in the community were not comfortable with this happening. It was a, um, a racially mixed population an economically raced mixed population working on this CSA. Um, it was something new in that area. And um, she, so after some time, she decided to invite people to the church for a service of lament. And she asked um, them to come and talk about the people who had been in the community for generations, their families for generations, talk about what had been lost. Um, and they just remembered how their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents had lived on the land. And she said that they all cried together. And she said at the end, the two questions as people were going out the door that she got most frequently were, when can we do this again and how can we help? Uh, and so older farmers began delivering their manure to this five acres. People, no one had been interested in their manure. No one had been interested in their skills or their right. memories. So, I mean, that's a, that is a different kind. It's not loss. Well, it is indirectly loss of creatures, but it's a loss of a culture, a lifestyle that nobody thought could disappear and it did. Um, and at the same time, parts of that lifestyle had to die. Um, and so it was a reclaiming at the same time. Uh, and the service for lament, I see there's a note in the chat. It was, they just got together and read Psalms uh, and then talked about what they heard.
Thank you. Thank you. I have an answer from the uh, uh, from those list. I mean, a question from those listening here. Can you speak to the role of quote crazy fear uh, end quote in destabilizing individuals or in destabilizing the culture? And is crazy fear always a negative force? Um, as I'm using that term, yes, I think crazy fear always is a negative force. I'm, I am talking about um, a baseless fear such as Pharaoh has of the Israelites, which, and it's, it's the combination of his fear and his contempt, as I said, that leads him to wish to exterminate. So yes, I, I do think that fear in that sense is always a negative force. I, a major point of the lecture is that um, there, are kind, there are definitely forms of fear that are anything but crazy. And part of our craziness is we can't feel all the fear that we should be feeling. Um, so it's a, there's a discernment issue here. Um, I, um, and the first part of that question was about, could I comment on crazy fear and how it operates in- In, de in, in I believe in destabilizing individuals or maybe even destabilizing cultures. Uh, could you comment right. about the, how um, it does that? Well, it, it happens when, um, I would say we see it amongst national leaders. I think that we're seeing it play itself out in, um, I think we're seeing it play itself out in Europe right now. Um, and um, I would say that we see a fair amount of fear um, operating in this country in um, it's at the base of our racial tensions. Um, and um, and our political divisions. Uh, so I would say that it was a kind of fear uh, that we saw on Washington in January 6th, uh, playing itself out in a way that I would say was crazy. And we can go on and on. I don't think that's the purpose of this lecture, but I think um, I think you all know what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, um, and we've got to, on the fear. Uh, we'll, we'll stay on this fear topic for a moment or two. Here, we've got a couple of questions that I can I can bring up. One is at the end of the lecture, uh, you talk about the time has come to cultivate holy fear. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have a question. Uh, can you can you suggest a couple practices maybe that help cultivate holy fear? Um, what a great question. Um, yeah, I think. Um, This is, it's actually, I think, not a question that I've ha had before. Um, as I said, holy fear would be, um, fear of the Lord is the biblical term for what we would call genuine faith. So I think whatever practices um, in your tradition um, or in your community, in your personal life, um, help you focus attention on the, the character and the action and the will of God, 
that's what cultivates holy fear. So I would say um, it's Lent. Um, as you're reading scripture, ask the question, what is, um, what is God doing in this text? What is God calling us to do through this text that works maybe it's too much to say works healing change but um, moves me in the first instance to become more aware of what I am doing that is destructive that in itself should move me to fear um, and then in the second instance, um, to at least pose the question and maybe share it with other Christians who's, or people whose discernment you trust to ask, what could we do to, um, to increase to get a little more on the side of the angels, <laughs> um, to increase our awareness of where the calling of God may be and where the hope may be in concrete ways. And I do think that um, in all of our communities and certainly there in Kentucky, but I see it in North Carolina, there are more opportunities because more people are aware of what we are doing and are more fearful of what we are doing, not in a crazy sense, right. um, have what I call a natural fear. Um, there are more opportunities to participate in healing action, to support that in some way. Right. Well, and, and uh, I'll see if I can craft this into a follow up because I, I think they're connected. You, you, you talk about the this differences of crazy, natural, holy fear and this conversion that happens at the Red Sea and a conversion that then lands them in the wilderness. And I think of your book, Scripture, Culture, Agriculture and Wilderness as this in between. And we're in Lent in this moment. Um, and do they become susceptible to their own crazy fear in the wilderness? Um, and so is, is that something that in this moment, that crazy fear, we run the risk of it falling back on us, of, of getting sucked up in it ourselves and our own crazy fears emerging? I'm trying to get a question in there. I'm not quite sure I have yet. Okay. But it, that, that's where my mind's going as you're talking and I'm seeing a couple questions about fear and connecting it back to Lent um, okay. and this season for us. So, Okay. Um, just what you've said helps me a little bit. I think two things happen in the wilderness. I mean, a lot happens in the wilderness, including the whole generation dies. Um, but um, as you say, in the wilderness, they experience fear. They want to go back to Egypt. What? There weren't enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here to kill us. Um, so they experience fear, um, which turns out in the end to be fatal. Right. Um, but the other thing they experience, and they're very, very slow to get, is sufficiency. And in if in Egypt, abundance is interpreted as surplus, because what were the Israelites building in Egypt? They're building storehouses okay, for the surplus uh, that belongs to Pharaoh. In the wilderness, um, abundance is reinterpreted as sufficiency. There is enough for everybody. Um, and food comes not from Pharaoh, but from God. Um, there's a 
rabbinic saying um, that Torah was not given at Sinai except to the eaters of manna. Um, and the, what that means is that until Israel could experience, could learn to trust God in the provision of their daily needs, they could never get what God was going to say from Sinai. Torah was not given except to the eaters of manna. Um, so in the wilderness, they get what they need to get in order to move forward in understanding and faithfulness and fear of the Lord. But it's really hard for them to get it, and most of them die because they can't. Right. And I think that ties back into your previous point about so the question about practices um, that, that come back up, uh, uh, sustaining practices of sufficiency. Um, now, we, we have a question I think ties in both to your morning lecture and your afternoon lecture. And I'll see if I'm asking this as, in the best way I, I, I can here. Uh, are there, I think the person's looking for maybe a, a couple of examples or some, some more examples perhaps of Hebrew scriptures that could help us imagine flourishing in the midst of and following trauma, uh, which is seems to be our universal present experience. And it occurs to me that the departure from Egypt, glory, as grateful as they may have been, was a traumatic experience. It was a very difficult moment. Um, and uh, so in, in some sense, the Red Sea is an example of that. But are there others um, exile, another master narrative that we might say. So are there some places you could point those of us who want to, to, to go reading and thinking, preaching and teaching in Hebrew Bible that we might go look at as a helpful stories? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And you're right. It, it does relate to what I said this morning. So in the morning lecture, I spoke about the visions of restoration. I spoke about Ezekiel, second Isaiah. I would think those would be, I mean, the whole last section of the book of Ezekiel. It's not easy reading, um, right. but the temple vision, you know, what you're seeing is a vision of restoration of people, chapter 37. Um, but the whole land being re reoriented around the temple and the city, which is, of course, we know the temple is in Jerusalem. Um, but interestingly, in that vision, um, the, uh, the city around which the whole land is literally reconfigured, the tribal allotments <laughs> are reconfigured around the center, which is no longer Zion or Jerusalem, it's called Adonai Shama, the Lord is there. It's a totally theocentric vision of reality around God's presence. Very similar, of course, Ezekiel is tremendously important for John on Patmos, also in exile, uh, also writing a prophecy, so the book of Revelation. Um, and that vision of a new heaven and new earth is um, a profoundly inspired by Ezekiel's vision. So those would be, and in both places, um, the restoration of, of the land um, is absolutely central. And in both places, you are seeing trees whose, um, Fruits are new in every season, um, and trees whose leaves are for the healing of the nations, as we see in Revelation. Uh, so those would be some places to look. Um, I would also say um, the theme of lament is appearing in my remarks here, but, and that's not coincidental. I would say um, read Psalms, uh, Psalm 65, the unique in that it's the only psalm um, that shows us a picture of God as a peasant farmer. Um, and, and it begins as a lament. It begins saying, 
um, our, you know, our, our transgressions are too much for me. Um, and so it, uh, it actually begins saying to you, God silences praise, but then it, it moves to lament, but then it ends with this vision of um, God driving through the fields and, um, and all of the creatures of the fields, we would call them animate and in a, inanimate, biblical writers wouldn't make that distinction, um, are singing for joy to God. Um, and I would say all of the lament psalms, all of the lament psalms are um, tending, they are spoken in the hope, um, they're spoken out of a sense of brokenness uh, in the hope of restoration. Almost all of them gesture in the direction of praise, um, looking toward a time when it will be possible to praise God again. Um, and even the few that do not move, make any move in that direction, um, part of what's powerful in them is that they are a very careful articulation of unbridled pain directed to God. Um, and that in itself might be seen as the flip side of hope. Okay. I, I, I was struck by the, uh, I'm always struck by the, the, the stories of, as you call them, the practitioners of faith, hope, and love, the women, um, in in that narrative and it occurs to me that all of those actions that you described are happening in the household domestic sphere and i'm wondering is there something here for us to consider that as we look at climate crisis uh our domestic spheres need not go unattended and maybe matter much more than we think in our capacities to thrive once more. Um, and uh, am I wrong in seeing it like that? Or do you, do you think no, there no, is I some help there in seeing the domestic fear, the small, whether it's the small farm, the small house, the small moments are where these practitioners can and need to be living uh, and having faith? Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and um, I'm thinking of, so one way of seeing that contrast would be to see the book of Ruth next to the book of Judges. Right, right. Um, and the book of Ruth entire, happens entirely within, not a village context, but the small farming town of Bethlehem, um, eight miles down the road from Jerusalem. Uh, in contrast, and it begins in the days when the judges were judging, there was a famine in the land. Um, so it puts us in the context of um, the cataclysmic public disasters of the Book of Judges, terrible national leadership. And it shows us the, the birth of hope in this little backwater of Bethlehem in the context of a family. So yes, I think, which of course, um, Ruth is the great, great grandmother of David, the mother of the Messiah in both Jewish and Christian traditions. So, um, so there's an, we're meant to see those, what's happening in Bethlehem as having ultimately um, by the grace of God impact on what happens in the nation. Uh, I think also of the um, story of, um, of Elisha, El Elisha uh, and the Shunammite woman. And she, oh, yeah. um, in Second Kings chapter four, and she looks out for him, feeds him, houses him. And he says, is there anything that I can do for you? And I think he's thinking of some, you know, great 
um, dramatic action. And she's, her response is, I live in the midst of my people. You know, that my, my needs are met. Um, in, she's not looking for some outsider to come in and do something dramatic. I live in the midst of my people. Um, so yes, I think that the, um, the Bible's the Bible's representation of national leadership on the whole is, does not inspire confidence. Um, so it, um, it focuses, uh, focuses us on our communities and so does the book of Acts. Um, Uh, I have, I maybe have time for one more question here. Uh, and this comes from your, uh, your, your former and uh, always student, uh, Dr. Levins, um, uh, who would like to revisit Pharaoh as a dominant political system, question mark, um, as a place uh, where she's taking off the blinded reading of scripture. Um, um, what has it been like? I'm trying to get the question right. What has it been like to teach this way of seeing Pharaoh for her? For her, how have your students received this this reading of Pharaoh in your in your classroom setting? How how's that gone? Um, I think. I mean, frankly, I think it seems fairly obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, tragically, it seems fairly obvious. Um, and though I would, I would say that um, I teach, I teach Bible. I don't teach political science. I don't teach economics. You know, I'm, um, I am. But it's been interesting to me, and I want my, I do not want what I teach only to be accessible to people who may have voted the same way I did in the last election. I think that would be a failure. Um, so this is a broader answer than that particular teaching, although I admit that I haven't had, I haven't received pushback on it. But when I decided now something like 30 years ago to start focusing my teaching more in, um, in the area of land and, and what's happening um, with land use in our own culture, something obviously with economic and political ramifications. Um, I, um, and I moved, that was, wasn't, it was a few years into that that I moved to Duke, where we have a pretty broad range, I would say, of political orientations and ecclesial orientations amongst our students, fairly broad range, uh, certainly broader than I'd ever encountered before. Um, and I would often have people in my classes who um, would, who probably didn't vote the way I had in whatever the previous election had been, um, and were not inclined to um, think that there was there was a problem um, and but for whatever reason you know they were in my classroom and I would um, I focus my attention on the biblical text and then I would just ask them to find what they could find out about the economics in their own communities. And it has so far never failed 
helped me um, in creating a conversation about these issues and, um, and alerting people to, I mean, sort of like what happened with my student, um, with my student that I was describing to you when she began that, uh, that community supported agriculture out of her Methodist church, just asking people to articulate or ask others to articulate what's going on in their communities. Um, and to, to begin counting their losses. And um, I've, I've really been surprised. And if I lead with the Bible and just say, you bring that into conversation with what you're reading here. And if I help them read the way I've been trying to do today, to read more deeply with the question, what's in it for us? Um, they take responsibility for doing that. And it generates a conversation. My sense is, I'm going to say two things, one about Africa and, uh, and one about American context. Um, as I mentioned, I've done a lot of teaching in East Africa uh, over the last 20 years or so. Um, and I started teaching in this area there because they asked me to. And I felt very anxious about that uh, because in the context in which I teach, I am usually the only North American uh, teaching. And as you doubtless know, land issues are exceedingly um, contested in Africa. Um, and, but, you know, they asked me to, and so I did, um, with great trepidation about how they would hear the white lady telling them about how they should be thinking about land. Um, and I found that as soon as I opened my mouth on this issue, it was almost as though I had said nothing else. You know, I could do this at the end of a week of teaching and it was the only thing people wanted to talk about because as one person said to me, Burundian, he said, every conflict in my country is about land. Um, and at the end of one week long teaching, I asked my students from different East African countries, what are you most afraid of at the end of this week? Because um, you know these are countries in which there's a great deal of violence. Um, and one of them said to me, I'm afraid if I start talking about this, I will never talk about anything else for the rest of my <laughs> ministry because this, this touches on everything in our community. Um, and um, I suspect that some of that would be true for some of you listening today in your communities. What I do, what I will say about the, the context in which I teach most frequently in this country in seminaries and divinity schools, um, and this gets back to my doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, if people are listening to me, then I assume that they are listening for what the Holy Spirit has to say to them. And in most cases, if people are listening to me, they are paying some kind of seminary tuition or they have greatly inconvenienced themselves to be in a situation where they're listening to me. Um, and they're not gonna waste that time. And God is not gonna waste that um, attention either. Um, and they're going to take it and do something with it. So I don't find, um, and if, and all I'm trying to do is tell them what the Bible says, and then they can figure out what the application is. Um, I'm, I'm really, I know I don't know a lot of the realities on the ground, but I'm a better than average exegete. 
and that's what I have to contribute. And so far, it seems to suffice. Well, I think you, you ended like you started. You talk about Baptist and leading with the Bible, and you come and talk about you just bring the Bible. So it sounds to me like you, you understand a little bit of, about what, um, what we Baptists deal with on a weekly basis. So leading with the Bible and see, see where it goes after that. So thank you, Dr. Davis, very much on behalf of BSK and all those who are here today listening. Um, it was worth it, and the Holy Spirit has certainly um, been speaking to us. Thank you very, very much for your Thank time. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Anastasia Holman, to offer our parting benediction for us today. Greetings to our distinguished guest, Dr. Ellen Davis, to Dr. Cassidy, the president of BSK, and to all BSK faculty, to the BSK staff, students, and the BSK community, to the Flourish Center, to our friends and guests here today. I am Anastasia Holman, an adjunct professor at BSK, and I greet you this afternoon to give remarks and the benediction. So not only is today an important day as we honor Dr. Eaglin Henson for the obedience and creation of the Henson Lectures, it is also Women's History Month. And what a way to honor both with the teaching and insight that you've given us today, Dr. Davis. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Your words of wisdom and insight have blessed and enriched our time together. Reading scripture with a critical imagination is an identifying activity of the church. It is for our survival and essential because of God's call and the scripture it's itself. As, as exiles, we begin to use critical imagination of the scripture, not fantasizing or using dangerous distortions. That's when we begin to understand our role in the covenantal triangle. God, the human creation and all God's creation, which is land, earth and non-human creatures. Something that I've learned in ACPE, it is not either or, it is both and because all God's creation is deemed good by God. It is by reading scripture and with a critical imagination that our hearts can be renewed to a healthy heart. This renewal gives us ade adequate language to our experience and gives us a vision of restoration for all God's creation. And that is chastened hope. We are called to speak truth and engage science as a conversation partner in this age of climate emergency. That's moral vision and imagination. Moral vision undergirds living out our days as a beloved community, living out and being for truth. Power, fear, and contempt can lead to genocide, forgetting that all creation is deemed good and worthy, not because we say so, but because God says so. We are called to look at our own power, fear, and contempt. Your lecture today, Dr. Davis, left me asking myself, how do I stand in opposition to God's plan for the climate and ecosystem? Where have I hardened my heart as it relates to climate change and how my humanness at times is a corporate Pharaoh taking and grabbing and using? We are called to love all God's creation. I heard you say babies and trees and I was doing call and response as my mute was on. This is risky love and risky work. The woman is the women in Exodus is afraid to encounter God's heart transplant. Fear of God is the opposite of pharaonic insanity. I'm going to have to use that. I'll give you credit a couple of times and then begin to preach that in my own sermons. As a womanist theologian, your work intersects with Melanie Harris's theory in her book Eco Womanism: African American Women and Earth Honoring Faiths. Like you, she signals the importance of an interdisciplinary approach and method to doing environmental justice work. Your work is a call to lament, healing of heart disease, and to bring a balm and love to the people in climate crisis. Thank you for your words, your work, your passion, and your heart. One turn towards God and all God's creation. It is time to do the work of holy fear. Let us pray. Oh God, renew a right spirit within us. Help us, oh God, to cultivate holy fear versus listening to our own voice, ego, will, and 
our own insanity. Be our sanity, God. Help us begin the work of critical imagination of scripture and to build a beloved community for all God's creation in our lives and generations to come. Heal us, O oh God, of our heart disease. Help us to go into the way that is forever. May we live and walk in shalom with God, other humans, the earth, and all God's creation. Help us to cultivate holy fear. Help us to display holy fear. Help us to live in holy fear, displaying your love and hope. In Jesus' name, amen, and go in peace. Wow, thank you, Anastasia. And that's it.